right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Behrens. I'm one of the PGY3s. I hope everyone knows me by now. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about GI decontamination. This is a pretty controversial topic. Uh, there's not a lot of RCTs that determine what is the optimal thing to do. And even the ones that do exist are pretty limited by their methodology. They usually exclude patients who we think uh, are gonna be helped most. So that being said, the idea of this lecture is to give you some idea of what your options are and, and who is considered a good candidate. But um, for the most part, there's not a lot of really compelling evidence um, in terms of like RCTs. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started. I, I made it waterfall themed. There we go. So let's talk about indications. So uh, whenever you're giving this, the first thing I'd want to think about is severe toxicity, right? So this isn't for skittle poisoning, right? This is somebody who took uh, something with that we think is going to be like a very, a very serious ingestion or something that we can't otherwise treat, right? Next thing you want to think about antidotes. So I, the ideal candidate for somebody who gets GI decontamination is somebody who does not have an, an available antidote. So think like large calcium channel blockers or something that's going to be really life-threatening, even, even if, even if uh, optimal treatment is given, right? I would say one of the most important things to consider is recency of ingestion. So this is we're we're going to go over all of this stuff again with each with each procedure. But when you think about recency of ingestion, generally speaking, it's within four hours or one to two hours, depending on on what you're doing. Um, but you should also think about not all pills are uh, put put drug into the bloodstream at the same rate. So extended release formulations are going to make you want to think about using gastric decontamination, uh, even if it's been a prolonged amount of time. And there are some drugs such as anticholinergics that can slow your gastric emptying. So these things are going to make you want to think of using GI decon. Right, I picked this picture of this uh, pandemic vending machine to make us think about tools, right? So this is clearly not the right tool to get this to get the toilet paper, right? Same thing with GI decontamination. You have to have the right tool to get the right drug, right? So charcoal does not absorb everything, right? So you can't, if it's a drug that doesn't stick to charcoal, you can't use charcoal. If the drug's not in the stomach, you can't pump the stomach, right? So you should think about what tool you're using in order to grab the thing that you need. And lastly, we think about airway, right? So this is the main, this is the main, uh, contraindication, the main thing you're going to think about of the adverse effects of GI decontamination. Aspiration is, is, is generally, um, it's, a, it's a rare side effect, but it's also a serious one. Um, there's a couple studies that I looked at for particularly this one with activated charcoal um, that essentially showed that activated charcoal is not actually giving activated charcoal is not a risk factor for aspiration. It's the other things around the patient, right? It's it was their likelihood of having decreased mental status, their seizures, the things that were correlated with our drugs, like the toxicity of the drugs that cause altered mental status. So these are, these are things you're going to want to think about when you're giving GI decon to somebody who took something that could potentially induce altered mental status, airway is going to be something you want. And then just consider that if you're giving activated charcoal, it's colored black. So if they vomit, you're going to have a really hard time uh, looking at the airway. So let's talk about activated charcoal. Um, it's usually made from coconut shells. They burn it, then they crush it up. Uh, this is what it looks like on a microscope. Uh, basically what you're giving is about seven to eight football fields of surface area inside the lumen of the GI tract. It's made of lots of little pores. But not everything sticks to charcoal. Um, the things, conceptually speaking, the things that make something stick to charcoal are things that are do not uh, blend well with water and are non-polar. So things that are polar or strongly ionized are not going to stick, right? Because they're going to be dissociated inside the water. So things that absorb well, organic compounds. So think pharmaceuticals, uh, CS, gas, like tear gas, um, lipids, non-water soluble compounds, and then non-dissociated salts. 
So things that don't stick. So these are, these are the important things of when not to use it, right? I put an Iron Maiden album up because that's heavy metal, right? So this is iron, lead, those types of things don't stick to charcoal. Uh, Gatorade because it has electrolytes. So dissociated salt, sodium chloride, potassium chloride, potassium phosphate poisonings are not going to stick to charcoal. And this is the, I would say the other important category is alcohols. So toxic alcohols don't stick, right? They're very, very polarized. They dissociate well in water. Um, although there is some evidence to say that if you were to give enough charcoal that you could potentially adsorb it, but that's uh, a topic we're about to discuss right now. So, oh, this is, so this is recency of ingestion. So for, this is a graph basically that displays how soon uh, human volunteers were given charcoal and how much drug they adsorbed. So this is a bunch of human volunteers. Usually I think, I think this one was with uh, a super therapeutic dose of Tylenol. And so what they did is they gave them charcoal at five minutes, 30 minutes, and then out and they measured serum levels and saw how effective they were at absorbing the drug. If you notice all the way at like four hours, pretty much very little drug is absorbed, right? So this is basically a, an in vitro study of, of a demonstration of the time efficacy of activated charcoal. So if you really want to get the drug, you need to give it within four hours. Um, and again, slow release formulations are gonna make you think about this differently, right? So slow release formulations, if there is still drug to be absorbed inside the lumen, you're gonna wanna, you're gonna wanna consider giving it. All right. And then, so now we have to think about dose as well. So the typical ratio that we recommend is you have to give a 10 to one ratio of weight and charcoal, right? The typical dose is 50 grams, which is contained in a 240 milliliter solution. So it's like a little bit bigger than a water bottle. It's a lot, it's, a, it's, it's more volume than you would want to drink of activated charcoal. Um, but drugs have different adsorbability to charcoal. Most organic compounds are somewhere in the range of like 250 milligrams per gram of charcoal. Um, this is another in vitro study, uh, of human volunteers looking at, uh, reduction of drug exposure to how much charcoal they were all given. So if you notice that the more charcoal you give, the better, uh, the better, uh, a, a adsorption of drug you get from the lumen of the GI tract. Um, so when you're going to want to think of this is with really large drug exposures, if you ingest four grams of verapamil, that's going to be 40 grams of charcoal to reach your 10 to one ratio. That's about 192 milliliters. If you ingest 50 grams of chloroquine, that's 2.4 liters of activated charcoal. So I don't think most people would be able to drink that even if they wanted to, it would be very difficult, or it would take more than one ingestion, which is where we get to our next point, multi-dose activated charcoal. So multi-dose activated charcoal, um, we can give it, we can give charcoal multiple times in order to reach our 10 to one ratio, but it also has another interesting uh, effect is that it, charcoal can actually pull drugs from the, your enterohepatic circulation into the lumen. So this study on the right is uh, a study from like the 1980s or so. It's about a bunch of volunteers who took exclusively IV theophylline, and then they were given multi-dose activated charcoal through their lumen. So they had no PO exposure. And as you can see, the group that got multi-dose activated charcoal actually excreted their IV drugs uh, quicker than the group that did not get activated charcoal. So that being said, it's interesting, right? It only works for some drugs. Uh, the evidence and actual use is not that clear. Um, there's two case studies I saw, one involved um, carbamazepine poisoning, uh, where some were received, some, the group was randomized to be re receive multi-dose activated charcoal or single dose. Um, so even though these, uh, the peak levels were similar, the group that got multi-dose activated charcoal basically had a uh, significantly decreased coma, mechanical ventilation and length of stay. Uh, but they've done this study with like phenobarb, which also has a similar, uh, a similar effect with its ability to be pulled from enterohepatic circulation. And they've basically found that 
that even though they were able to reduce the half-life of phenobarbital and serum, that there was really no ch meaningful change. They were ventilated for the same amount of time um, and they had the same uh, ice, amount of ICU stays. So interesting concept, something to think about, um, probably wouldn't do it without consultation with the toxicologist. All right, so let's talk about whole bowel irrigation. So what is, what is whole bowel irrigation? What do we mean by it? So um, basically you give a really large volume of osmotically inactive fluid, uh, usually uh, go lightly into the GI tract in order to facilitate drug passage. Um, and typically the rate that you wanna give it is 0.5 to two liters an hour. Um, there's not really any RCT to my knowledge that whole bowel irrigation works, but there have been several human studies that show that it can be comparable to activated charcoal in terms of reduction of drug exposure if given within a timely manner. So again, the recency of your ingestion really, really matters here. Um, we, we think about whole bowel irrigation in those previous times when we know activated charcoal will not work, such as lithium, the heavy metals, the electrolytes, um, or in some cases of slow release tablets or things that are, things that are uh, condensed up that, that activated charcoal can't get. Um, but at this point, I think that a lot of the benefit is somewhat theoretical. So another time uh, to think about whole bowel irrigation is when you think with, is with body packers. So there's a number of case studies published using whole bowel irrigation in order to uh, get uh, these concealed drug packets uh, out. Previously, this was typically done by exploratory laparotomy. Um, however, whole bowel irrigation has had some success in allowing people to avoid uh, surgery. And typically this is given with erythromycin or Reglan. Um, contents of the packets actually matter. So if it's a large opioid ingestion, um, it's, it's, if, if it ruptures, you can do mechanical ventilation intubation. You can overcome hypoventilation with that. Um, but if it's a cocaine packet, it's pretty catastrophic. So that being said, if somebody has a cocaine toxidrome and they have known packets inside of them, don't do full bowel irrigation. They got to go to the OR. Um, one caveat is that, uh, you, you really need a, a very compliant person to deal with whole bowel irrigation, as you'll find out in a second. Uh, and particularly with these people, they're going to be asymptomatic. Uh, so it leaves you with a, a uh, I would say, a difficult ethical situation because I wouldn't want to do whole bowel irrigation on anybody who didn't want it. So what about both? Can I do activated charcoal and whole bowel irrigation? Um, so it's not uncommon to do both, actually. Um, the, the, the issue comes with doing whole bowel irrigation after giving activated charcoal. Uh, there's been some in vitro data, uh, particularly with multi-dose charcoal that, that giving whole bowel irrigation a long time after charcoal actually paradoxically increases your absorption. And the reason why is your charcoal absorbs all the drug and then it gets displaced by, by the polyethylene glycol. And so it, you're, it basically moves off of the charcoal and into the gut lumen to be absorbed. So they are given together, but they're given together in close succession. So don't delay one for the other. All right, so let's talk about whole bowel irrigation. So first thing first, right? Call, you gotta call poison control, right? If you're thinking about doing GID con, I, I would imagine that the person took something serious enough to warrant a call to a toxicologist. And they also probably have an opinion. All right, step two, you gotta give an antiemetic, right? So the most common complication of whole bowel irrigation is an inability to tolerate it due to nausea and emesis. So be mindful of this. You should be giving an antiemetic. That being said, also be mindful of the antiemetic, right? If someone took something that prolongs QT, right? Don't give Zofran. Um, you should think about the side effects of the uh, antiemetic as well, All right? Step three. You got to insert an NG tube and a rectal tube. Um, generally speaking, if you're giving 0.5 to 2 liters an hour, you're going to need a rectal tube and uh, an NG tube in order to handle that amount of volume. Um, at this point, we should also be thinking about airway, right? So it's not, you don't necessarily need to do it, but 
but you should be thinking about whether the person can tolerate this volume and if and what's going to happen if, if they aspirate and if they can control their weight weight because it is it is it is possible or and or likely. Um, also head of bed head of bed above forty five, right? So how do we give it? So there's a couple ways. I've read about uh, using pumps, enteral feeding pumps to do this. Uh, generally speaking, a lot of the enteral feeding pumps don't go above one liter. So there's a flush function you can use that uh, you can search for, or you can actually hang it to gravity. You can hang go lightly to gravity and do that through the NG tube. It's also possible to uh, just push it manually by hand. Um, and then, so I have our adult dose. Adult dose is typically one to two liters. And then for children, you're gonna wanna do uh, 25 mLs per kg per hour. All right, so step five, you wanna reassess. So make sure they're not doing that. Um, if, if they do throw up, you got to decrease the rate, right? So you decrease the rate, you cut it in half, you give more antiemetic, and then you reassess. If they remain symptom free over the next hour, you can slowly titrate back up to the volume. And then, okay. And so the next step is when do we stop? Basically you stop until the effluent looks like what, what goes in, right? So you want, you want it to be clear. And generally speaking, you should be checking for pills or other ingested stuff as well. Occasionally people give activated charcoal at the, right at the very beginning of whole bowel irrigation to mark basically the, uh, the, the end of, of, uh, of, of the effluent thing that once the activated charcoal's out, you'll begin to see black, right? And so the idea is that everything that was ingested before that is presumably out as well. Okay, so next. So that's, we talked about activated charcoal. We talked about whole bowel irrigation. So the last one to talk about, gastric lavage, right? So essentially gastric lavage is, is, is your classical idea of stomach pumping. This was really popular in the, in the 1950s and 60s. Um, but as, as time has gone on, it's sh these patients have shown to have been, like have been shown to have a lot of complications with this. And so, we've become a lot more critical of, uh, of patient selection. That being said, it is probably one of the few GI decon methods that actually has uh, proven benefit if given within a certain amount of time. And that amount of time is about one to two hours, right? So somebody really needs to have recently ingested pills. They need to be in the stomach. Um, and again, when you're thinking about this, you gotta think about it's a pretty invasive procedure. So is it a severe toxin? Uh, can I give an antidote? And particularly for this one, you have to think about what the risk of aspiration is. Um, the AACT, the American Academy of, uh, or the American Academy of Clinical Toxicologists basically uh, say that this is really not for routine use. Um, so let's talk about it. Step one, call poison control. Step two, you should consider intubation, particularly, particularly if they took something that's gonna make them have altered mental status. Uh, you really, you need to give this before, even if they're as asymptomatic. So you should really be thinking about airway uh, before, and if they're already intubated, then, then that actually makes the decision to do gastric lavage a little bit easier um, because your main concern of airway is already taken care of. All right, step three. Place them on their left side. All right, step four, insert an OG tube. So this is not an NG tube. Uh, I wanna mention that this is like a 36 French tube, right? It's big. Uh, and then probably like a 24 to a 28 French in children. So you gotta measure it, make sure it's in, uh, make sure it's the right length to go into the stomach. That being the, one, of the, uh, one of the documented case reports for complications of this procedure is esophageal perforation. Uh, from this large tube. So be mindful of that. Step five. Uh, so you got to verify the placement of the tube. Uh, keep in mind that the next thing you're about to do is flush 200 to 300 milliliters of normal saline into this tube. So you really want to make sure that this is in the stomach. Uh, if you give that amount of fluid endotracheally, that's considered poor form. We don't want to do that. All right. So then you're going to you're going to verify, you're going to aspirate gastric contents first. So you're going to, this person is ideally intubated. They have an OG tube in and you have a large syringe that you're trying to draw uh, effluent out of. 
the other option is you can actually place the OG tube to wall suction. Actually, you don't have to do it manually. And then after that, you're going to instill 200 to 300 cc's of warm, normal saline or water. Um, if it's a child, actually, you want to use water specifically because, or you want to use normal saline specifically because there have been some case reports of children getting hyponatremic from just giving uh, large volumes of water through this procedure. Um, and then basically you continue this process until what you push in looks like what you come out. So there's no more particulate matter or pills inside of the effluent. And once you're done aspirating and flushing, you're going to give another dose of activated charcoal. Um, the reason why we do this is gastric lavage doesn't always draw things up towards the esophagus. If you're pushing a lot of volume, particularly if you're doing it vigorously, you're going to push some of the drug or some of what's in the stomach into the small bowel to increase absorption. So you should really be giving activated charcoal once you're done to get the rest of that drug. And then you're going to remove the OG tube. So the last thing I wanted to briefly mention is Epicac. Right, so this is kind of a vanishing therapy. They used to recommend that parents keep it in the house so they could make their children vomit if they ate something. Uh, this, right, it's obviously probably one of the highest risks for aspiration because it actually makes you vomit. That's what it does. Uh, this is, no, nobody will essentially recommend this. I wouldn't give this unless explicitly instructed uh, by poison control. So let's talk about what we learned. Right, patient selection. So patient selection is really important, right? This is not really routine therapy um, and it's not gonna be effective unless it's a really recent ingestion um, and unless, it's, unless this, uh, the, de the decon is given in an adequate dosage. Um, and even then it's not worth it unless it's, unless it's toxic, right? Unless it's a really toxic drug. Um, things that we've discussed. So what, what do we use, right? Activated charcoal, full bowel irrigation, or gastric lavage. So you're going to decide those things based on whether or not. Uh... So we're going to decide those things based on basically, is this the right tool and is this the right drug? Um, and then, uh, so the recency of ingestion is an important factor, but there are certain toxic circumstances that are going to favor one of these or the other. And then the last thing I want to mention is you want to call poison control. Uh, the toxicologist has an opinion about this, and ideally you're dealing with a severe intoxication. Right, and these are my references. Any questions? What's that? So, yeah, so the, you would probably, so the reason to pick gastric lavage is, is essentially one, you're instructed by a toxicologist, uh, but two, it, there, there are some older RCTs that, that show that this is one of the ones that actually can demonstrate benefit. The other, the data for the other ones is, is le a little less convincing. Um, so it would have to be hyperacute. Um, potentially somebody who had an airway that's already secured, um, it would make you probably want to air more on the side of, of gastric lavage as opposed to the other ones. One is, I don't think you mentioned it, but you definitely don't want to use charcoal if you have a very caustic injection, like a very strong base or a very strong acid. You, you don't want to use charcoal there. All it's going to do is cover all the burn black stuff. That's yeah. a definite contra absolute contraindication charcoal. I'll repeat that for the Zoom crowd. So uh, Dr. Gernsheimer wanted to mention that another contraindication to using activated charcoal is that you don't want to use it with caustic ingestions um, because it will get into the caustic burns in the esophagus in the stomach and, and cause further damage and it won't adsorb drug. That's a very good point. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to mention where I have use whole bowel irrigation uh, is like you said with heavy metal, with iron in it. I have used it and it seemed to work pretty well with a massive ingestion of iron. And the other thing, just to qualify what you said, when you're using the a gastric, you know, lavage, real gastric lavage to get rid of big pills or anything like that, these are very big too, as you mentioned. These are 36 to 40, and they're not so easy. Put in. I remember a case, 
that happened at, at a hospital in Manhattan where they put one in and then as they pulled it out, they pulled a part of the stomach with it. Ugh. So <laughs> you just have to be very careful. Okay. Uh... Dr. Grinshummer wanted everyone to know about a, an anecdote in which he, uh, <laughs> part of the stomach was pulled out with a 36 French OG tube. So be mindful of that if you were to ever do this procedure. Okay, anything else? Okay, thank you. No